Come on, let's give the Lord a praise in this house tonight. Come on, you can do better than that. Come on, you can do better than that. It's always good to be here, this great church. Now, you, you need to pray with me and pray for me. Just keep playing, guys. That'll be fine. Because uh, I kind of stripped my gears this morning where I was preaching. But I believe the Lord is going to touch me because i got a word for you. Amen. Are you ready? Ushers, you got, you got those books? We're going to do something. Now, I know most of you have got my book, Forgiving the Unforgivable. And uh, I think a lot of you do. If you don't have it, then you need to stop by the table and get it. This little book has traveled all over the world. God is using it. I'm not bragging. I'm bragging on God to touch lives, to set people free from unforgiveness. So I want five people that would love to have this book. Trust me, this is not a gimmick. Five people that would stand up right now that you'd love to have it. You don't have it, but you'd love to have it. Would you just stand up? There's one, two, three, four. I need five, five. Now five that'll get down here real quick. Now what's, what's the gimmick? I just need five. One, two, three, four, and five. Well, there's six, so we'll make, we'll make it accept. Come on, ma'am. This is for you. This is for you. This is for you. This is for you. And this is for you. And we're going to get her a book, too. And this lady. Get, make sure He'll make sure you get it. But I'm not through. Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> How many of you like Christmas music? Two of you. Okay. Well, I love Christmas music. And we just recorded a new Christmas album. And uh, we did this. I'm going to tell you real quick before I get into the Word. We did this in Nashville. It took me nine months. I'm slow. Forgive me. And nine months, how many have heard of um, the Happy Goodmans? You've heard of the Happy Goodmans? Johnny Minnick was the producer of this album, and Michael Sykes, who has traveled with the Gaithers. Uh, the Tennessee uh, Orchestra's on here. Um, the Gaither, some of the Gaither background singers are backing me up on here, and it'll be a blessing. Now, last year when it first came out, you said you'll take this. Okay, that's fine. We got it. I was finishing up. Now, you got to remember, I've been singing these songs for nine months. I'm tired of them. Even White Christmas. Mary, did you know? It, this is my wife's favorite. Don't tell Blue Christmas. I was tired of them. So I got in the car. I was preaching somewhere and come home. Janet was driving. We were in her car. I got in the car. And guess what she was playing? My album. I said, honey, do we have to listen to this album? I've been doing this for nine months in Nashville. She said, without hesitating, it's my car, it's my CD, and I'm going to listen to it. Forget it. I said, forget it. Let her listen to it. I don't ever listen to it. If you take my voice out of it, it's a great one. There you go. And there you go. And there you go. And I'll autograph those books in the back if you stop by there. Boy, you need one more, and you go back to the back and get it, okay? God bless you. All right, God bless you. Give the Lord a praise. Now, all the rest of you got to pay for it. <laughs> you still love me? Some of you do. Well, my wife's here tonight, and we have been married. We're getting ready to celebrate 44 years of marriage. <laughs> We got married in elementary school. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and uh, in a minute, I'm going to show you something on the screen. David will have that ready. I, I mean, 44 years, that's a long time. Some of y'all looking like, how is that possible? With God, all things are possible. She is a wonderful person. She wouldn't want to come up here. If I brought her up here, she would make me sleep on the couch for the next month. But she's quite a lady and a, quite a prayer warrior. I told her if she ever leaves me, I'm going with her. 44 years. And um, I hope we have another 44. If we don't, we'll have the rest of it in heaven. Whatever. Um, so I'm glad to have her with me. She doesn't always get to travel with me, but she's with me tonight. And I'm delighted to have her. She is uh, just a beautiful human being. I'll say it like that. 
And then I have some guest family here tonight. Uh, my first cousin, hold on just a minute. My first cousin is here. She's an author now. I had her on my television program. And by the way, you can get our program, Kingdom Talk, starting next week right here if you got Roku. Okay, you can watch it. It's filmed in Atlanta, but you can get it. And Lindsay Corbett Stone has written a great book. I told her to put the books on the table. It's called Gospel Glitter. I'm telling you, it is a powerful book. Lindsay, would you raise your hand? Would you just raise your hand? She's right there, the blonde. And that is her father, which is my uncle, Daryl. I spotted him a few minutes ago. He's here tonight. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Give them all a hand clap of praise. Come on. Can you flash? Now, there's a reason for this, trust me. Can you flash those family pictures up real quick? There, oh, there they are. That's my family right there. And that's not all the grandchildren. Okay, give us the, that's the newest one right here. This is Caleb. And the reason he's got that look on his face, he was looking at me. He's um, six months there. And I'm going to be talking about the family tonight. The family is so important. You got that other one, David? The one with just me and Janet and, the ki and our three kids, how it started? You got that one? No? Okay, that's all right. Stand with me. We have three children and 15 grandchildren. And nine of them are girls. And my oldest is turning 16, and she's wanting a car, and it's three or four weeks away, I think. She'll turn 16. How many of you know we need prayer? <laughs> if you have your Bibles, turn with me tonight to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to read one verse of Scripture tonight. Let me say that I appreciate... That's not it. That's, that's me and Marcus. And, well, y'all know those people. Anyway, that's not it. But that, that's all right. I thought you had one of me and Janet and the kids. Just the kids. Just the three. That's okay. What was I saying? I lost my train. <laughs> y'all messing me up now. Um, yeah. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. I do want to say I appreciate your pastor and Joyce. I tell you what, I've known them for... I've known them for 30, a lot of years. And I remember when we used to preach for Jeff and Joyce, we, we, we thought we'd really done something if we had 50 people. And we had some of them. And, and that's important, and that's good. And look what God has done. And look what God is doing. One of the greatest men you'll find anywhere, we've done vacations together in Gatlinburg. That's one of his favorite places. And Joyce, they're just the finest of the fine. They really are, and we love them. It's always an honor for me to be here, me and Janet. Thank you so much for inviting us back. And I thought today about my wife and, and Sherry here tonight. Sherry and I went to high school together, and she's here tonight. God bless her. Give her a hand clap of praise tonight. And your brother, is that right? Your brother? God bless you, sir. And uh, I, I was thinking uh, about my wife and and. You know, she's listened to my stories. She's listened to a thousand times or more. And she still laughs at my jokes. I'm just surprised tonight after 44 years, she still wants to hear me preach. Y'all are so sanctified out there. Are y'all living in the world I live in? Okay. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 5. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side and without were fightings. Everybody say fightings. And within were fears. Oh Lord, I feel the awesome responsibility tonight to bring this message to this great group of people. Don't let me say one word out of your will, but everything that I say, may it bring honor and glory to your name. There's a great responsibility upon my shoulders tonight, Lord. I don't take it lightly. I need your touch because without your touch, I'm a zero and a nothing. I ask you to stand by me. Give me strength in my voice, clarity in my mind. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Shake hands with somebody. Tell them you're looking the best you can. 
And I must say it's a real delight to have Mike and Jamil Mills with us, the great singing couple anointed. What a powerful couple they are. God bless you, Mike and Jamil. We love and appreciate you and your family. I want to talk for a few minutes tonight about hold on to your house. Hold on to your house because we're living in very tempestuous times. There seems to be distress and suffering and pain on every side. And Paul knew this when he wrote this verse, the great apostle. People are under pressure and suffering for the sake of Christ to some degree or another. But even when we have joy and when we rejoice like we are doing tonight, there seems to be an underlining groaning within us because we want to be delivered from this distressed, filled world. Mentally and spiritually and physically, we are under great pressure. We want to be delivered from the sin that so easily besets us. The thoughts and the words and the attitudes and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. It seems... It never really goes away. And as hard as you try and as much as you pray, when you get up off your knees, you walk 20 steps, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden it's back on you. And you're back in the battle. And sometimes we grieve the Holy Spirit. And we long for the day when suffering will be gone. Amen? Amen? Distress is outside. I don't have to tell you this. You know this. We live in a messed up world. The world is under the control of the devil. People's hearts have become hardened. And they have become resistant to the truth of God's word. Now I believe that Satan senses that he has very little time left. And he is unleashing violence and evil on this world and the church. Demons have been unleashed, and I can't tell you how many, countless. Bloodshed across our nation. Humanity is being robbed and raped. People are under the influence of demons. Distress of nations. Well, the Bible tells me right before Jesus comes, there will be distress of nations. And the devil is working overtime to try to kill and destroy. Something has got to give. Something is moving in this world that I cannot see. And when I begin to think about that, Pastor, and I think in those ways... I think about my family. And the devil has launched an all-out attack on the families in this land and the church. You know, we pray about the nation, but our nation is no better than the families in our nation. And the church is no stronger than the families in the church. And the church can't be any closer to God than the families because they are the church. Oh, come on, somebody. It's not the nation I'm worried about. It's not the government I'm worried about. It's not the politics. It doesn't matter who the president is in the white. That's not worrying me. I'm worried about the families uh, who are under attack by the evil one. And children are acting the fool. And we're talking to each other like heathens. And we use foul language. And children are totally disrespecting their parents and cursing them and calling them names. And parents do the same thing to the children using vulgar language in everyday conversations. We're not teaching our children honesty anymore and truth and and manners and and good citizenship and good Bible uh, training and good church attendance. 
Those things have been abandoned because, and because of that, there is a distress that has gripped the church because it has gripped the people in the church. And so he said in 2 Corinthians, you've got to say, understand this is the Apostle Paul. This is the man of God. He said, I'm troubled on every side. I have conflicts on every side. There's fighting going on. There's people in the church have turned on me and I don't know where to go and where to turn and fear is eating me up. Did you know that inward stress and distress is a real thing? But I think the lowest blow the devil can give to a Christian is when he finds you in a weakened condition and he teams up with your old nature and your old man and you turn on yourself. And you look in the mirror and you start saying things. Look at you, you hypocrite. You're a fraud. You're a fake. Why, you're not even really saved. Have you ever had the devil tell you that? Because First John said, if our heart condemns us, but God is greater than our heart. Did you know that our heart can be wicked? Come on, somebody. Did you know that our hearts can turn on us? Our heart can condemn us. There is a part of you that is not your ally. Mm -hmm. Because you're, you are your biggest enemy. Let that one sink in. And, and when Satan teams up with your flesh, he causes you to turn on yourself. I believe that really is one of the worst, most depressing things that can happen to a human being. And, and, you know, sometimes, Pastor, I've got to be careful sometimes because I'll say this and I'll say that. And you know what I found out? The devil will test you on what you say. So you better make sure you know what you're talking about. Come on, somebody. But David said, in my distress, I trusted and I believed in God. Are you hearing me? But when the devil tries to tear you down, I like this because God will always send the scripture to build you up. He'll always send somebody by to help you. He'll always send somebody by to undergird you. He'll always send somebody to say, hey, I was just thinking about you the other night, and I went in the prayer room, and hey, I called your name out, and all of a sudden you felt something's happening in my life. Something's happening in my spirit. Woo! I'm going to tell you, that's real stuff. Because sometimes it takes his faith for me and my faith for you. Mark 9, the boy, you know, the, the dad brought the boy to Jesus. He had a bad spirit. He was demon-possessed, and he was mute, and he was, he was foaming at the mouth. There's a lot of people foaming at the mouth. All kind of vile, uh, vile and, and vulgar language coming out of their mouths. I'm going to tell you the way I feel about it. If I'm sitting trying to watch a movie, and they use my Lord's name in vain, I'm getting up and walking out. You say, oh, you just got to get used to it. No, 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 not in my home. Oh, we're, I lost that shouting crowd. <laughs> and Jesus stood there for a minute as the man brought his son. And he just kind of looked at him. He said, how long has he been in this condition? And you know the story. Jesus delivered him. He was not intimidated by demons or devils of hell. He didn't even raise his voice. He just said, be gone, be healed. I tell you what. He also said this. If you can believe, all things are possible. I got 50% of you on that one. If you can believe all things. Let me tell you something. I believe when I'm having a bad day. I'm going to believe when there's a surge of unbelief that has suddenly choked something out of my life because of what I'm looking at and what I'm seeing happening in my life. But what I see is not always what it is. Oh, y'all not hearing me. And then listen, that boy would have never got to Jesus had his father not brought him. That tells me something. That's why you can't ever stop taking your children to Jesus. When you're down, take them to Jesus. When you're discouraged, take them to Jesus. When nothing seems to be happening in your world, nothing seems to be happening in your life, and all of hell is breaking loose, take them to Jesus. There's healing at the foot of the cross. There's deliverance in the name of Jesus. I speak that name, Jesus. Take them to Jesus. Well, you know, I don't know, Craig. I don't know the direction that I need to go. Well, I got a scripture for you. He said, you stand in the way needing direction. Ask God for the old path. Where is the good way? He said, the old path is the good way, and there you'll find peace. Sometimes we need to go back to the old path. 
There you'll find peace for your soul. In other words, the old path is a well-traveled path. Hallelujah. And sometimes you just got to go back to those old paths. And listen, he said, and if you'll travel that path, I like this, you're going to have rest in your soul. It's going to go well with you. And you're going to have your steps ordered by the Lord. Now, many of you are asking, which way should I go with my family? Which way should I go with my life? And my word tonight would, for, to you would be this. God said, go to the old paths that have been tried and tested and proved. We need a revival of the old paths to this new generation. We need to understand that there are some things that don't need to change. Some things need to change, but there are a lot of things don't need to change. And we need to go back and we need to look up the life of Paul and Abraham and Isaac and Ruth and study their lives and follow the path and walk that way and live that kind of life. Are you hearing me? I'm telling you, our families are treasures tonight. Outside of Jesus Christ, my family is the most important thing in my life. And I want to tell you, your family, your family, look at somebody and say, your family is a great treasure, a godly family, a family that loves God and the truth. It is a monument in the 21st century, a family that will go to church and serve God and read the Bible and do what's right. That's a monument in this century that we're living in right now, church. It honor, a family that honors God, that is valuable. And many families are being destroyed. But to have a godly family, to have a family that's intact, to have a family that's committed to Jesus, a family that loves one another, a family that spends time with one another, a family that prays together, a family that worships together, is a treasure. There are evil forces in this world that are doing everything within their power to destroy the family and destroy homes. Across America. Your life is about your family if you're saved and committed to Christ tonight. You're not going to let the seducer destroy your family. You're not going to let that happen. A godly man, a godly woman will know how to shun the seducer. A godly family will resist sexual advances. A godly family will not flirt with text messages. Preaching better than y'all letting on. A godly family will not go to places they should not go. A godly family will not allow their minds to be filled with filth and uncleanliness and the things of this world. We need families that are anointed. We need families that love Jesus. There's some old paths. That we don't, let, we don't need to let the devil steal. Come on, somebody. Oh, how we need men and women that are, that are full of God's power and know how to pray and know how to fast and know how to read his word. You need to know who your children are hanging out with. Oh, I just hit a nerve right there. I said you need to know who your children are hanging out with. You need to know what your children are watching in the back room on the internet. Come on, somebody. I'm going to get down right where you live. You say, that's all fanatical. No, no, no. That's called holiness. And without holiness, no man shall ever see God. I tell you, we need to put filters on those computers. We need to go in that room and say, son, I love you, but you're not going to do that in my home. You're not going to watch that trash and filth in my house. This is the house of the Lord. For me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. And if it's not holy, then it's not going to stay in this house. We're going to do an inspection. We're going to get everything out of this house that doesn't edify Jesus Christ because I want my family to go when he calls. I want my family ready. I want to see my family when I get to heaven so I've got to stand against the seducer that would come to destroy my home I love you but you just can't do that now when you get out of my home you may want to do some things but while you're under my roof y'all still love me you got to remember I'm an evangelist I make people mad when I preach I'm probably going to make you mad before the night's over. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, I feel the anointing in this place. I heard a story about a man, true story of a pastor, and he had a precious woman in his church. She had a son that was out one night dr drinking and driving, and he was in a bad accident, and he was killed. True story. And the boy had a sister and a brother, and the pastor was asked to do the funeral. And he said he stood, sad story, but there's a lot of truth in it that I'm going to get to. He stood over that coffin, and he looked out at that precious mother and those two surviving children. And he said he felt led to tell the story, the Old Testament story of Rizpah. And you know the story. Rizpah was one of the wives of King Saul. And the Gibeonites had invaded the territory, and they killed Rizpah's sons. And the Bible said they hung them on a tree. But Rizpah would not give up on her sons. And the scripture says, she went out and she fought the night. Listen to this. Fought the night creatures off, fought the animals and the birds. She sat out there for months and months, wanting her children to be cut down from the tree, even though there was nothing more than rotting flesh and bones. And the pastor turned to his mother and he said, the Lord told me to tell you tonight, fight for what's left. Fight for what's left. I thought about our families and how so many times we look at the holes in the walls of our families and our family's not what it used to be. And we've been through some wars and, and we've been through some fusses and the enemy has decimated and destroyed so much of the family structure in the 21st century. There's holes all in the walls and there's a lot of regrets and, and there's a lot of pain and you feel like your family's never going to be what it used to be and it seems like you want to just quit and, and give up because because your family has been wiped out. You're tired of the attitudes and the problems and having to deal with all this stuff week after week after week after week. But I come to tell somebody tonight, you got to fight for what's left. you got to hold your hand up in the face of the devil and say, devil, enough is enough. I'm going to fight for my children. I'm going to fight for my grandchildren. I'm going to fight for my family. I'm going to fight for my church. Woo! I'm going to fight for my family. Hallelujah. Because Oh, listen to this. Because just as sure as God can preserve a family, he can build some walls back. I tell you, he can build some walls back. You, oh, I feel the anointing in this place. Hallelujah. The walls have been torn down. It looks like there's no use. Uh, the family is gone. But I come to tell somebody the devil is a lie. God can build those walls back. God can preserve your family. God can redeem your family. God can restore your home again. Hallelujah. Woo. Maybe you've been through a divorce. And I'm compassionate to you and towards you. Maybe you have a child that's been addicted to something and left your whole family a mess. But the Lord told me to come here tonight and tell you to get out on the battlefield and hold your hand up in his face and say this, I'm going to fight for what's left because God knows how to rebuild and God knows how to restore, and God knows how to bless my family again. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Anybody believe that? Anybody believe that? I'm not telling you something I read in a book. I'm telling you something I live. Come on, somebody. If you lay down, the devil will walk all over you. You've got to stand up and fight. Can I have a few more minutes? Look, look at somebody and say fight. fight. Say fight. fight. I need a usher to give me some water. <laughs> I don't like to do this, but I need a little water, not cold, but I need something, please. Say fight. That's what I'm doing tonight. I'm fighting. <laughs> the greatest thing in your life is your personal relationship with Jesus. David, listen, I come to tell somebody, hell is not going to win. Hell is not going to win. Fight. Everybody shout fight. Fight, fight for what's left. David sinned greatly. Listen to this. 
He sinned greatly. The enemy had ravished his life and took so many treasures from his life. And, and, and he had everything that a person could want in the material world. But he cried out in a deep repentance. This is what he said. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Do you know what he was saying? He was saying there are some things that are more valuable than cars and money and houses. He was saying that there's no business deal that can compare to the treasure that I found in Jesus. There's no amount of money that can compare to the treasure that I found in Jesus. There's no illicit affair that can compare to the treasure that I found in Jesus. Nothing but the enemy is coming to destroy every trace of godliness in your life. Because he comes to rob and to steal and take that. Guard your family. How many of you tonight would say, I've got a loved one and I care about them and I love them and they're lost and they need help from God. Their help is you. You need to start praying for them. And I know you probably do, but let me tell you something. When I tell you that Jesus could come tonight... We know people that are not ready. We love them. They need help from God. It should stir me. It should stir you. We should not panic, but it should drive me to the most powerful thing that I can do for them, and that is intercede and pray. Are you hearing me? Jesus is coming, but there are people that I love that aren't looking for him. There are people that I love that he's the last thing on their bucket list. They have come to a place in life where they have been blinded by the world, by the lust of the flesh, by the lust of the eyes, by the pride of life. It has literally, church, captured them. And Noah, when he found out the whole plan of God, notice what he said. The first thing he thought about was his family. He said, my household, I want my whole household to be saved. You see, I need to hold on, and you need to hold on to your house. You need to grip it. You need to, I don't care what the devil told you. You need to never let it go. Well, you don't know what I went through. You don't know what my son said. I don't care about that. Listen, it's, it's in your hand, and it's on your mind. They're in my prayers. They may, they may not be in my house, but they are my house. They came out of my loins. And having a family doesn't mean that you're always going to live under one roof. And then when everybody leaves, it's over. No, it means that you are a part. They are a part of you. Walking around, they are a part and have a part of me in them. My children will always be my house. My grandchildren will always be my house. God doesn't expect me to ever let go of them. I don't care how far they go. I don't care how far they drift. It's my house. I'm going to guard it. I'm going to protect it. I'm going to proclaim it. I'm never going to give up on my house. I'm going to hold on to my house. They may, oh, I feel God, somebody wave to the Lord. He, they may be a thousand miles away. They may be a million miles spiritually, but you got to hold on to your house. You got to keep building on your house. You got to keep working on your house and preparing it. Come on, somebody. Don't you ever say whatever. Are you kidding me? That's my children. That's my grandchildren. Those children are a gift from God. I know you got some crazy cousins that are out on another cloud, but you got to love them. Uncles and aunts, they're your house. And as long as I can breathe, I'm going to call their name. As long as I got breath in my being, I'm going to say, I don't care how many times I have to say it, devil, you're a liar. Did you hear that? I said, devil, you're a liar. You're not going to have my family. You're not going to have my grands. You're not going to have my children. You're not going to have my church. You're not going to get us. You're not going to discourage us. I'm a child of the most high God. There's royal blood flowing in my veins. Greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. And I'll just stay, I'll just stay right where I am and begin to dance on your grave. Hallelujah. Because I know your future and it doesn't look too good. 
Woo, somebody say praise the Lord. Somebody ought to shout pray. Pray for your family. When you pray from earth to heaven, it's like an atomic bomb that goes off. Woo. I think sometimes my puny prayers, Lord, how in the world do they ever get to you? But I believe, Pastor Jeff, when we get to heaven, we're going to look around and see people that were saved and delivered and healed by our puny prayers. Come on, somebody. Pray when you don't feel like it. Pray when you do feel like it. Pray when hell's coming to your front door. Pray when you're going through hell. Pray when the doctor's report is bad. Pray when you don't feel like it. Pray anyhow. God wants to save your whole household, your complete household. God listens to me when I pray. And God listens to you when you pray. Something always happens when you pray. I said something always happens when you pray. You can't see some things that are happening right now in this service, but they're happening because we already pray. Come on, somebody. Come on, help me tonight. When I pray, something happens. Mark chapter 2, I don't have time to go into it, but the four men, they love this guy that they let down through the roof, but I like what Jesus said. Well, actually, the Bible said Jesus saw their faith. <laughs> so I wrote this down. The Lord wants you to have faith in him for them. Y'all missed a good place to shout. The Lord wants you to have faith in him for them, whoever them is. Come on, somebody. Woo, hallelujah. Because if you can have faith for them, he can bring them to the foot of the cross and he can redeem them and he can save them and forgive them and turn their whole life around just because of your faith and your prayers. Hallelujah. I got to move on, but I tell you what, I feel the anointing in this house. Faith works by love. Somebody said, well, does God impose himself on us? Well, I'm going to tell you something. If God doesn't impose him, himself on our free will, nobody's going to get saved. I'll tell you why. Because it's not natural for anyone to just want to look to God, wake up, raise himself from the dead. It's totally impossible for a sinner to get saved on his own or turn around and go to the cross on his own. God must touch them, and the Spirit must affect them. And it comes when faith-filled people begin to pray. And Jesus said, ask, ask, ask anything in my name and I shall, will do it. I'm telling you, prayer, Brother Mike, is an indestructible force that we haven't even tapped in yet on. The devil doesn't want you praying. The devil doesn't want you on your knees because let the weakest saints begin to pray and all of hell begins to tremble because men and women begin to call upon the name that is above every other name. There is no name like the name of Jesus. The matchless, powerful, all-sufficient. Jesus. Are y'all getting this? Somebody needs help, but I can't obtain it by myself. Well, maybe you need somebody to help you because Jesus gave me the authority and walk into the very throne room of grace and take what I need and go back into the battle. <laughs> somebody I love needs help. They can't get to God. Somebody you love needs help. But you see, I can get to God for them. And you can hold them, and you can hold them in the presence of God. And you, listen, the crowds, oh yeah, there were crowds there that day in Mark. But he said, they climbed up on the roof. I may have to climb up on the roof. Because I'm going to let, I'm going to do what God tells me to do. And I'm not going to let people keep me from doing what God has told me I can do. So I'm going to tear up some shingles. And I'm going to tear up some tile to get to them. And how do you do that? On your knees. I'm telling you tonight, church, it works. There have been many a times at the midnight hour, and many of you could attest to this, 
Sometimes it maybe when our children, when we were raising our children, and just because our children were preacher's kids, let me tell you, they were not perfect. <laughs> Neither were yours. Problem with mine, they'd been hanging around the deacon's kids too long. <laughs> but I can tell you, there have been many a times that we got a call late at night and something was going wrong with one of our children, usually our boys, <laughs> not our daughter. She probably, she didn't ever do much. Uh, my boys accused me of never whipping her. But I said, well, she didn't ever do anything. <laughs> but they call us and we would start praying. Sometimes I've laid on the floor for hours and Janet and prayed and prayed and God never, never, never turned me away. He never said I'm too busy. But he said, listen, you hang on. Joy comes in the morning if you'll hang on to me. I happen to believe that anything is possible if you believe Jesus. None of us would be saved tonight if God had, a, had not interrupted our lives. And God had not vetoed our spirits. The apostle Paul would not be the apostle tonight or that back in that day had Jesus not interrupted his life. If he can do it for Paul, he can do it for me, he can do it for you, and he can do it for your family, and he can do it for your weirdo cousins, and he can do it for your aunts and uncles. I want to tell you because we love them enough to pray for them and call their names out. There is power in prayer. I'm almost through, but you're still getting this. Sometimes you've got to be intentional. I told somebody the other day, I don't live like the world because I'm not of this world. I said, I'm not of this world. Your affections determine your closeness to God. We're not of this world. We're not supposed to act like the world. We live in the world, yes, but we're not of this world. They call them sipping saints. Well, my Bible tells me wine is a mocker. I'm not being ugly. I'm just trying. I told you I'd make some of you mad. Drinking and wine has no business in the child of God's life. I'm going to tell you that. And, and neither does the rest of that mess. So if it doesn't look like Jesus, if it doesn't spell Jesus, if you don't discern it's Jesus, you better run because it's not Jesus. And you can live the rest of your life miserable as you watch people destroy themselves or you can say, I'm filled with Jesus and I trust Jesus. And even when I don't know how to pray, the Holy Ghost prays through me. But if I need prayer, Somebody can pray. Or if I know somebody that needs help, I can pray the prayer of faith. And the Bible says, when it is prayed, if he has committed sins, his sins will be forgiven. Now, I want to tell you something, church. We have the greatest opportunity tonight to stop what the devil is doing to our families. If we can just decide, get this real good in your spirit, it's not going to happen. Whatever the devil is telling you in your little mind, you need to talk back to him and say it's not going to happen. You're not going to have my family. You're not going to have my children. You're not going to have my wife. You're not going to have my husband. You're not going to wrestle my house out of my hands. You will not. God gave them to me, and I stand upon the word of the living God. I stand upon the word of the living God. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody praise him. I'm going to stand on this book when I don't feel like it. I'm going to stand on this book when it doesn't look good. I'm going to stand on this book when I don't know what to do because I've learned if I can just stand there in the middle of it all and say, I trust Jesus. No matter what comes, I trust him. Woo, give him praise in this house. I'm not going to watch them die and go to hell. This is real. 
When a paratrooper, sit down just a minute, then I'm going to close. But when a paratrooper jumps out of a plane, he can't jump back in. <laughs> when you step through the door of eternity, you can't step back. <laughs> I just want enough pastor Jesus in my life that it'll win my children and my grandchildren. If I never win anybody else, if I win them, and I'm going to. And they're growing up. They're growing up quick. Yours are too. And guess what? The enemy's after them. But you can pray. And God can lead them down the right paths. Out there is trouble. Out there is bloodshed. Out there people are mixed up. People have lost their minds. But in here there's peace and joy and power, and deliverance, and healing, and security. If you mess with me, I'll just walk around in it for a minute. Because this world is troubled, but this world is not my home. Hallelujah. I've got another place I'm going to. Hey, I'm not trying to be arrogant, but there's one thing for sure. I know I'm saved, and I know I'm ready. So should I go, brother, tonight? I know where I'm going. Hallelujah. There's no doubt in my mind. Praise God. Give the Lord a shout of praise in this house. I stand on the promises of his word tonight and the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. How in the world can I wrap this up, Lord? But let me just, let me just tell you tonight, if you care enough of that fam for that family, then you take them to Jesus. I had a drug problem when I was a young kid. A real drug problem. And my mother, she drugged me to church every time the doors were open. <laughs> I think I'm okay. Now, I was pretty mischievous. I was pretty, uh, I don't know the word mean, but I think I was mischievous. Wasn't I, Sherry? You were in high school with me. I was kind of mischievous. <laughs> But thank God I got saved and got sanctified, brother, and got the Holy Ghost. You see, the simplest thing you have is the mightiest thing you possess. Oh, I better say that again. Y'all didn't get that. The simplest thing you have is the mightiest thing you possess. You see, faith is not an explanation. I, you know, I cannot explain the way things are in our country right now. I don't know what made him do that or what made her do that. or I don't know what happened in their past. I don't know what they saw in their school. I do not know. Faith is not a force. Faith is not the power to change bad circumstances. Faith is the ability to trust Jesus no matter what. That's what faith is. Faith is not a feeling. It's not a confidence. It simply says, I trust Jesus. Mike, you and Jamil, come and get ready. Don't play yet, but just get ready. Why don't we wake up, church, to the realization that we can use the power of intercession to change things in life and in this world? There is a riot going on in the atmosphere of darkness. And Satan never wants us to realize the power of intercession. He doesn't care how many times you study the Bible. He doesn't care how many times you come to church as long as he can keep you off your knees. He doesn't care how involved you are in the church as long as you don't pray. But I come to tell somebody, God is a prayer answering God. And the God I serve is a God that is able. And I'm going to take hold of my house. I don't know what I will face. I don't know what may come tomorrow. But I do know one thing. I trust this book and I trust my Lord. Somebody give him a praise. Don't you ever give up on anybody. Don't you ever say it's over for them. Don't you do it. That's a I stand in the face of the devil and say, devil, you are a liar. In the name of Jesus, they're coming through. In the name of Jesus, they shall be saved. My whole household, my whole family. 